Even if family members contributed to the success of the company or to the success of the business, the inheritance that they get is not commensurate to the work that they put in. If they're paid those a $100,000 a year because they're the, they're the CEO, but when their dad dies, they get $1 billion, that's not commensurate to the success that they created anyway because the success of the company of $1 billion was really created by the father. So the inheritance he gets is uncommensurate and he didn't, the, the, so. the he didn't deserve to get that wealth anyway. But secondly, for a minority of instances where we have rag to riches, uh, rag to riches instances for capitalist societies, we say that the state enabled them anyway to be able to become rich by giving them opportunities to be rich and by dismantling social or structural inequalities that would ban them to be rich or to be poor at the end of the day. So even for those rag to riches, the basis of ownership is given by the state themselves. So they don't, re they don't really have the right to transfer wealth unilaterally at that. But third, it's not just about ownership. We're talking about concentration of wealth. We have a lot of social inequality. It's a gulf. We have a case of, of a difference between the richest of the rich and the poorest of the, of the poor. And this is enabled by structural inequalities. And what contributes to this enabling of structural inequalities is inheritance. Because you have a generation of systematic discrimination that allows blacks to be poor and whites to be rich. Blacks are not by coincidence poor in the United States. They're not lazy or incompetent. But because whites had the advantage of history in terms of segregation and getting licenses, the structural inequalities allow them to be rich. That's why it's not just the ownership, but the concentration of wealth to this certain select group of oligopolies or uh, races at that. So the conclusion of this first argument is that there is no right to transfer anyway. And even if there is a right to transfer wealth, it is very minimal. And the right to receive that wealth by the living relative is fictional as well because he did not contribute or did not work hard for a commensurate kind of inheritance. Yes? Why is inheritance tax insufficient? Oh, that will be dealt with by my third argument. So let me move on with our second argument first. And the second argument is that inheritance breeds structural and social inequality. Wealth gives you advantages. Um, but if they're going to defend their side by saying that inheritance tax is enough, that's a concession that they also want to minimize the structural inequalities that wealth creates. So, because wealth creates structural advantages, we say that it's random, it's unfair for inheritance to be allowed because in inheritance, it's a birth lottery. Just because you're the son of that person, you didn't choose to be the son of a poor person. You didn't choose to be the son of a rich person. So in inheritance, it's really random that you get $1 billion. So it breeds structural and social inequality on the basis of unfairness on which family you were born in because it breeds structural advantages for you to surmount in terms of getting rich. So, in a democracy where you're told that all men are created equal, you're not really created equal because inheritance allows families to be unequal when you transfer wealth um, from family to family. So let me answer his POI. Why don't we allow for inheritance tax alone? Why is inheritance tax insufficient? Because of the problem that we pose. The uber concentration of wealth right now we have in capitalist societies. Oligopolis exist. Rich Hacienderos exist in the Philippines. In the United States, you have the uh, CEOs who own 90% uh, of, of the wealth of the United States. No amount of inheritance tax can reverse and bridge the gap of social inequality between this 5% and the 95% of the people. Because even if you tax as much as 70% this kind of inheritance, if they have 1 billion wealth, he will still get $300 million. And $300, $300 million is already sufficient to create structural advantages that is unfair to people who are born to poor families. So if you're going with inheritance tax, it's really insufficient. Guys, the only way to reverse this is, is to ban inheritance all kinds of inheritance and not just ban it by a tax. For all those reasons, because we were born and created equal and we are told to be equal, inheritance should not be allowed. Thanks.
the open space for Night Red Moody Light, the opposite of the leader, Imra. It is true that addressing social inequality is an important and noble goal. It is also true that it is important to recognize the autonomy of an individual and decide exactly what happens to the wealth that we created. What more? We argue that when we over fetishize the search for a remedy to social inequality, we effectively inhibit one of the most major sources of helping the poor and the most vulnerable in our society, which is the inheritance retrieved by rich individuals to community projects, to replace, for example, help uh, black colleges to enable people to now rise above their own social condition and improve themselves. And we think this causes a massive harm. I'll be talking about the points of standing. The first is talking about the nuclear family and secondly the harms that are poisoning on the community, but before that, a few rebuttals coming from our side. We reject their characterization of what inheritance means. We don't think it's just a matter of receiving it to relatives. We also think it's about you receiving it to institutions like university. We think it's about you receiving it to things like community projects, to community colleges, because there's also the inheritance of individuals to try and establish a legacy for themselves, and one of the main projects for this would be to inherit it. Let's look at the audience. The first time we had an image was that we tried to solve social inequality and social disparity in our society. The problem with this is that it assumed that their policy will work. We don't think so. What's ostensibly going to happen as a result of their policy? Which individuals are going to do one of two things? A. Park their wealth in tax havens overseas or in areas overseas where the government cannot reach that wealth to be able to tap into it to benefit other members of society. Or second, they gain access to local lawyers to be able to create trust funds for their children in order to circumvent the ability of these individuals to try or to circumvent the ability of the state to achieve their inheritance to their, uh, to their, their loved ones. And the problem with this is that you won't be able to achieve an entire critical task that we think they are conditioning on that side of the house. What we rather have is the imposition of inheritance tax and coupled by your other forms of taxes to create that pool for social welfare spending. Next, they argue that rich people didn't do it on their own. In fact, they inherited most of their wealth. We don't think that's the case. Whilst in some instances individuals do inherit their wealth from their forefathers, it is also true that in most cases individuals created the world wealth for themselves. What we recognize is that whilst we have a US leader, and this is a warrior's argument coming from that side, that you didn't do it alone, that society has some help in creating that wealth for you, we think it would be more or less a switch to things like inheriting tax. We think that the majority of the wealth is attributed to the ability of individuals to generate that wealth for themselves. That's why we won't be watched Steve Jobs a lot of his money, because we recognize the importance that he saw to companies like Apple in generating the kind of profits that they have in the last few years. Next, they said the birth lottery. It's really, really bad. We need to do something about it. We don't think they're doing anything about it at all on that side of the house, because there will always be rich children who will be able to get better education during the lifetimes of their parents, who will be able to get the upcoming advantage anyway. Moreover, in recognition of the ineluctable reality, we think the best thing to do is to try and establish some ability for individuals to mobilize themselves socially, to things like social welfare programs, to improving education programs. And we think the best thing to do is not the imposition of what they are trying to do, but the accumulation in concert of different forms of taxes to try and get that as best as possible. I'll be talking now up to the first points of substantive, the need for the family, and then three points to this. First, they were absolutely right. We think individuals have a proprietary interest in the wealth that they created. Essentially, what they're doing on that side of the house is theft. Because what they're doing is that the state, upon your death, is able to take every single cent that you took, without your consent, by the way, and obviously without your acquiescence, and you're going to the things that they want. We think that theft that all will be tolerated just because they're the state. Secondly, we think it is prerogative for most individuals to try and take care of their family as much as possible. During your lifetime, you work and you try to your awareness to try to create the best life for your family. What we see happens is that we think this is another means for you to do that, albeit a point of death, where you allow the inheritance to be a means by which to hide your children to things like the payment of tuition in college, to ensure that even though they might not be able to rely on you anymore, that they don't really have to worry so much anymore as well. And we think that this actualizes their conception of what it means to be a good parent, and we think this is especially important. Thirdly, we think their policy is pernicious because they disproportionately disadvantage the families that cannot prepare themselves for the eventuality. Rich families will be able to prepare this by engaging corporate lawyers to create trust funds. However, if you're not rich enough or you're not informed enough to engage the corporate lawyers, or if your parents die accidental deaths so before they were able to make the necessary plans, these families will be disproportionately affected 
by pernicious effects of that policy, we will be in that step. Next, arguments for the community. We need to recognize what the degree of that side of the house. If that side of the house, I'll be in a minute, with that side of the house, there will be now changing the emphasis on immediate consumption rather than establishing a legacy for themselves into investing in things like investment, investing in things like property, creating a legacy for them, where your name and your family will be okay. If you were to ask the head of the Middle Group or the Tata Group, one of the main things that they said was that even though making money was fun, they also thought it was important to the families as well. But before I go on this, Sir, why are you arguing for the consent of individuals when you also propose an inheritance tax that is very honorable to your side? No, because we think to an extent, some degree of consent can be taken because we recognize that the real estate comes into building that law for you. But it also appreciates the reality that the other part of your world is attributed to you as an individual, and that is the value of the real estate. Right? So, what happens when the emphasis moves from basically things like immediate uh, long-term projects to gain or immediate consumption? One of two things. One is that you remove the main impetus for wealth creation in society. While some individuals make money for fun, most do it to try to create at least something for their families to be able to capitalize on in the future. Again, look at the examples I talked about the Vital and the Pata group. The problem with this is that this kind of legacy project is one of the main drivers of growth in the economy of most modern countries. Because when these individuals create as big corporations as they possibly can, they create things like environment, they create a boost to their economies as well, and we think that's massively important. Secondly, what this does is that it removes the major source of health for some of the most vulnerable in our societies as well. If you look at most universities, they're taken on philanthropy basically for them to be continuing on. Things like, for example, the elite black individuals in the United States of America who are rich and then pass on basically their wealth to black community colleges or to other community projects or to areas in Detroit or other spots of Canada where black individuals require most help and try and enable those individuals in those societies. Or thirdly, even I don't agree with you, right? The typical Muslim example of Waka, where rich Muslim individuals keep their access to their property so that they can enable this bunch members in the community to benefit off the property of the land that they live in the United States. What do they do that they remove a major incentive or a major source of help for these individuals? They might argue that they can do it, but we think it's not a matter of who does it better, but recognizing the importance of autonomy in these circumstances, recognizing that these individuals ought to be given the authority to decide what happens to their world and what exactly the kind of effects they want to create on that basis. So for these reasons, I am very proud to oppose. Reach 
principle, the guys are there because there are higher values that the society acknowledges are more important. Based on the fact that we get to help out everyone else, but how can it also your enablement in that society? But lastly, if you look at it, where is it that the tax tax becomes more effective or most effective in approximating equality in society? It's when you increase it, right? It's when you make sure that it comes close to the fact that it's with our model and the fact that we don't even have inheritance in status quo. But in our inheritance, but if you look at it, the incentive to create investments or wealth that trickle down to others will be reduced. Um, I don't think so, right? I don't know why they think it's a problem. Because everyone naturally wants to acquire wealth so that they can experience while they are alive a good life. What we are removing, though, however, in our model is the ability of individuals to excessively want to offer wealth. Wealth that they can no longer experience when they are alive. Wealth that they can simply keep for themselves even if they're already dead. That's why we think that this is the type of disincentive that you are placing on individuals to make sure that the type of wealth they will do is only sufficient for them and their families while they are living. We agree, it may not be effective enough and it may not be you know, applicable to all the masters out there. But the fact that it will affect some does not negate the ability of our policy to still influence society in the benefits that we're going to accrue under our model. The third thing is this. He says that, but if you look at it, we shouldn't upset the rich, because the rich are the primary source of community progress and altruistic actions in society, right? That's true. That's why you're right. That's our model, right? We're trying to take it away from them forcibly, returning it to the community in a sense of community projects. The only difference is, under your model, you're going to rely on the fact that individuals are altruistic and they are something, and that they're going to voluntarily do But what if they don't? And what if, naturally, they just want to give to their children because they're worried about them, like they are in your model, right? So obviously, that type of community project is more reinforced even under our model. So yes, that's a value, but it's better enforced under our side. But here's the last thing. He says, but if you look at it, you're not completely solving inequality because children throughout their lives will still experience advantages anyways. That's true, right? But the fact that we're using it is still not going to be the value under our model. We may not be solving inequality completely and entirely, but we're still reducing it under our side, and that's the value you have to engage with. But second of all is this. It's also true that in status quo, people do experience inherent advantages when it comes to genetics, when it comes to wealth, when it comes to where they are born at. That's why in status quo, we're also trying to equalize those things with comparative and congruent and concurrent mechanisms to supply the band of inheritance tax to make sure that if there are other assets in society that will create inequality, we will also get to respond to them. Just because they exist doesn't mean they are value. Just because they exist doesn't mean that they are good and that we want them. That's why we also want to take them down under our side. But here's the last difference I want to draw. What is the difference of the nations while individuals are alive and when people are bequeathing right before their death and inheritance upon death? The difference is, while individuals are alive, their actions that generate an unequal society can be suffered through by them. They can suffer the consequences of their actions. I mean, the paranoia that while their daughter is going to walk out there in the city, they may be mom. Because out there, there's an individual who is poor and they want to commit crime, right? But when individuals are dead, even if they're the ones generating inequality in society, they will no longer feel the pain of the types of inequalities that they are creating in society. That's why we don't think that they already have this right to be able to defeat them to others. If they do try to circumvent the law, we agree that that's bad. So what we're going to do is to catch them and send them to jail in that because just because there are people who can abuse the law or circumvent it does not mean that the law must not be released. It only means that the enforcement of the law must be strengthened and be better under our side. So those mechanisms can be worked on later. For the launch trip. What's so bad about middle class parents trying to save the $10,000 for the benefit of their child? It's a lie. Middle class parents are typically the ones giving inheritance to their children, right? It's usually people who acquire excessive wealth in status quo because middle class parents that want to make sure that their children get the best of what they have while they're still alive. What then is my argument? We think that this is the greatest response to intergenerational equality, inequality that has been massively and systematically bred in generations and generations back. We're not just talking about inequality in generations before you, right? We're talking about structural injustices that states and our ancestors founded in societies before. Because you have to look at it. Why is it that blacks in the United States or in South Africa so predominantly are poorer than individuals who are white in society or in the United States, right? It is why is it that women, for example, still have 
have less salaries or have on average in almost all industries right now. It's because the mistakes that we have made consented to the pervading our systems in the past as to the military institutions and mass. I think when my, for example, if you're a gold man from the Chicago Indians when they were still slaves, for example, and you didn't have to like, uh, IP rights or indigenous community rights, we didn't think that we allowed them to use that money, create generations of inequality, advantage their own families, and make sure that the state is duly paid back but only in a small amount. The conclusion is simple. In the long run, the two payments that should have been done, that should have gone to the state for these social and historical injustices have never been paid back. And it's about time that we at least provide them some sort of compensation and ensure that we provide them opportunities to be able to utilize those inherent and systematic injustices that for generations we have acquiesced to and tolerated. This is why we think that it cannot be an issue of just one family to the next. Because this is a societal issue that has been experienced from the start of our history until the way we are living them now. At this very moment, we cannot say that inequality is going to be completely solved. But at least the fact that we're attempting to reduce it is still principally correct, it's still principally better, and this is why it's decided for GDP. Thanks. Power to kind of in, in, 
create laws and policies or tax provisions in order to evade those kind of very things that we think that's a problem. But secondly, we also tell you that the problem of birth or the birth is not solved, and we don't really address it because we think it will continue to exist under, under the other paradigm when you have the kind of special education of private schools for individuals, the ability to pay up front in a prepayment fashion to develop whatever you know, the child needs in the long run. We tell you that ultimately their policy screws the poor over because there is no ability for the poor to seek the kind of legal protections that they need. Ultimately, what we want to say is this. We want to say that ultimately, when you, you don't essentially need to punish you know, individuals. There's actually no moral right to punish individuals who are middle class, who are actually developing a certain wealth base because ultimately they are saving are only meant to provide a fuel for the further development of their lives. But then they told us that, they told us that well, you know, you benefited on the backs of the state. Here's our stance here. I don't think they understood us exactly enough. Because we said we were okay with providing some degree of inheritance tax to recognize that they did contribute. You know, the state did contribute to their success. But at the very same time, we think people have a proprietary interest in the items that they possess, in the assets that they possess. They spend hard work, sweat, blood, and effort to develop what we develop. They work hard hours and we think we need to recognize that. Because otherwise, in your absence, every one of us will become like my friend Chua Jiki over there. Because he just basically wants to live for immediate consumption and the immediate kind of life where fulfillment of our destination in life are achieved on the short run. We think ultimately you give effect to a particular long-term kind of perspective when you allow when you have to occur. And that's what fuels the economy, which is what Imran and Ali we talked about Mittal and Tata, where there is a reason why they want to you know, develop something for the long run, the capital investment, the investments into the future, beyond their debts and beyond their lives, right? We don't think their policy creates those very similar incentives. It changes the way in which people live their life into a short run model, into a short run you know, process. And we think that doesn't help at the end. But they told us, well, you know, why don't you just direct everything, you know, the community projects to every, you know, back to like the state to distribute. We think that's not sufficient because we don't think the state is the best actor to distribute that kind of wealth because ultimately they're fueled by special interest group, they're fueled by the kind of political interest. But more than that, more important is the concept of autonomy, which Imran Ali and don't think we address because ultimately there is an old prerogative of an individual to maintain what his life's life, you know, savings are about, what his life efforts are about, and we think that our policy allows for the greatest flexibility when it comes to that. Our, our outside of the house is very happy to recognize that there's some degree of intergenerational equality. But under your model, you make it worse. Because the poor are the ones who ultimately get screwed over. Because understand that wealth is one that is transferred from generation to generation to generation. What you do under your model is you short circuit that process and school people who are currently poor today in disproportionately rather than those who are rich who are able to afford many of the material things that get social mobility in life today already and we think that's particularly problematic. But you disagree. Under your side, the the only groups that the disciple groups that can influence the government will just have to directly for the law under your model. But the thing is, the entire side goes on the street of the state. So even if they're not that perfect, they're still better in the law. Well, we think individuals are the ones who take what they are. Items and their possessions and property are. We think ultimately the state is not the right actor when it comes to personal property. When they have to invest that blood and effort and sweat into it, they get to inheritance tax, but they cannot take everything. Let's go into explaining our side, our, our my extension. I'm going to start basically, it's basically about how inheritance creates a cultural conflict of transmission. We argue this, we argue that very often inheritance represents not just simply money, it represents more than that, it represents the lives of individuals manifested in physical things such as an heirloom, such as a family house, a family home, a family, you know, uh, environment. And we tell you that that kind of physical things require some degree of transmission to inheritance. Because in the absence of that, you allow for the scale of all of this. What occurs as a result is that kind of cultural transference doesn't happen when you have an inheritance, when you ban an inheritance model. Because you don't allow for collective communities to develop, to want to, and these communities are good for society, because we want to support each other in terms of families, in terms of foundations, in terms of plans. And there are even private companies that really create a certain level of culture. But secondly, and more importantly, inheritance gives people like you and I more meaning in our lives because it creates a sense of obligation to future generations. Because what we do now is ultimately all of us want to think 
in order to create some kind of legacy for our children to inherit. It transforms our lives into something that projects towards a longer future. Not just today, but look towards tomorrow and when we are dead and gone. And that's what allocates the very autonomy and you know, the purposes of our life. Because otherwise, we all just look like self-interested individuals who are just selfish. It just doesn't want, it doesn't speak to the idea that society best benefits when we want to create more in collective. When we want to create more for someone more than just to be ourselves. And that's what inheritance has on a very personal level. It elevates the meaning of our lives and creates utility for people because they can be satisfied that a legacy is created of their lives. Because their policy is absolutely discriminatory, it doesn't allow for the kind of progress because our policy strikes the right, the right balance, we're extremely proud to oppose. Well, thank you. When it comes to facilitating family and business, 
It doesn't have to be gender. We're not the only ones going to run the business. I'm sure you have partners, you have people who work in the board of directors. They know how to do it. So when it comes to facilitating our passing on this particular legacy that continues a business society, it doesn't have to be your children. But we need an alternative. Like if it's a house, a brooch, a ring, an heirloom, maybe even a farm, ladies and gentlemen, you can buy it if it's a special interest item to you. That's why there's a crucial special significance to this particular person. Wouldn't mind paying for it. No, thank you. What we did respond to was our historical analysis of how a lot of the times the money that you need and you get, and the reason that we're so structurally embedded as the elite is because there was a historical unfairness. Unfairness, sorry. Unfairness. Like how the blacks are typically poorer because the blacks were systematically and overall harmed. They weren't given proper jobs, they weren't given proper pay for, they weren't able to the money that would have given them that edge today. And this is stemming from an unfairness that the government tolerated and that they at least abused. That is why there is a principled basis for removing it from these people. But ultimately, are we totally unfair to them? No, we don't think so. Why? Val told you, and Jesus told you that, you know what? Even the idea that we're improving society accrues back to even the richest people who give billions of dollars to this particular policy. Why? Because we create things that they can't buy with their money. We create a safer society where more people are in power, where more people don't have to steal, where they can walk in the streets and not feel threatened by every single person because you don't think that they're all after your money. Ladies and gentlemen, when everyone is for everyone, we don't need to be afraid of anyone. And that is the externality that we create that they absolutely don't. That is why the conclusion to the first issue is it fair to suddenly come back to these people because of their activity in accruing this wealth? Yes. Affirmative case. Yes. If you agree that individuals have an interest in their property when they're alive, why does that magically cease when they die? Well, Val already told you, right? Because A, they won't recruit the in, they won't accrue the harms of the inequity that they impose upon society, right? You don't feel the fear of walking in the street. But I've given you so much analysis that I think that that is not even not necessary anymore. Second point, second question I want to ask is, is it overall better for society and therefore the government's interest to remove inheritances? There are a lot of things I want to get rid of. Let's start with it alone. He said, it's easy to sidestep. There are offshore accounts. There are trust funds. First of all, we're already cracking down on offshore accounts, right? Look at the Cayman Islands. The EU's already doing that. So he said, in our prime minister, one of the first things he said, there is something principally analogous to inheritance, like offshore accounts, trust funds for your children, selling your properties at 10 pesos for an entire hacienda. Those are things we're going to be against as well. So all of these things we can, we've already covered in our policy. We're trying to stop any kind of inheritance, even if it's offshore or trust funds. We're going to try to ban that and stop that and crack down as well. No. The next thing that the leader said, that it will just incentivize immediate consumption. Well, first, let's look at the converse. What does your side identify? Hoarding, ladies and gentlemen. So if we're going to think about it, really, ladies and gentlemen, if there is any consumption versus hoarding and keeping the wealth within the family, then isn't that consumption even better? It stimulates economic activity, number one. It pays for jobs and it pays for food, ladies and gentlemen. And that consumption, we believe, ladies and gentlemen, is still valuable. Because the hoarding that they have is structure. Last, uh, the last thing from him is that it removes philanthropy. Valerie argued why that's exactly our policy, philanthropic. The last thing that the DLO said is that the state is a bad island leader, and that's why it's not better for society that we remove these inheritances. First of all, the state is also your actor, because you're giving them the inheritance tax, right? So the state is totally reliable as well. So why are you bashing your own person? But secondly, we told you that it is the financial elite who usually have this capacity to nudge the state to give them concessions. So instead of on our policy where they have to nudge them, in your side, well, they'll just pass on their money to their children anyway. That's why at least if they have to nudge them on our side and corrupt them, they have to go through that extra step and make it harder. On our side, it improves society because you create a social value that allows you to walk the streets on a break. It allows you to send a child to a public school and not have people grimace and say, ew, you're from Ladies and gentlemen, we are improving society as a whole. There is no response coming from the opposition that brings that benefit to them. They are satisfied with keeping the wealth to the elite and to the people who are structurally oppressed. That is something that I am completely proud to propose for.
to it for his speech. Was it in the case of the negative being by the opposition to it only? <laughs> Let's talk about the middle class, right? Because 
He said there are two responses at first. No, thank you. The first he said, that he said, the middle class don't save money. Are you kidding me? Middle class and people who spend the most time and effort trying to ensure they can build a lot of wealth for the children. Then he got a slightly better response and he said that, yes, at least by starting a wealth transfer, right, their life becomes better. But here's the thing, right? For many of these middle class families and their children and their parents, what's important is not so much the physical direct wealth that they're able to get or the benefits that I gain from the state. Because you think that people derive a bigger benefit and utility when I know that they need something personally for my children, instead of having an impersonal government immediate increase that provision of benefit for me and my house. Because the children themselves find a bigger utility and benefit knowing that this is something passed on to my father. It is how they are staying, for example, that the, that the money I don't get. It's something that my father gave me, and I'm not ready to treasure it, I'm not ready to value it. But it's more important to these people than having a state come in and say, I'm going to steal it from you. If you want it back, why don't you give for it an option? And I compete with other people to give for it an option instead. You can get solutions, right? Especially when you think these middle class people will probably never be able to outbid rich people. And finally, you think communities that are left out by the state. You know, this is very important. So, well, you know, like, uh, let my people in America or like Muslim individuals who feel that they need to fill in the gap that the state leaves out. Because they think that the state doesn't address their community needs sufficiently. They think they need to undertake some sort of private charity to reach those things. And we think those things are important as well. They have the ability of people to transfer the law in that particular fashion. Last argument the rights of individuals and why we think it's bad. Because we are arguing very cool, very, very supportive, right? Look, you have some autonomy over the money, control of money, and you're alive. That autonomy extends not only to how I want it to benefit me, but how I want it to benefit people that I care about. That's part of the autonomy and the right you have over the money. That's why we say today, even though it's fact that you do of it, because you think the state did contribute to your wealth, your ability and the fact that you did contribute to it means you're right to decide how I want to use it to make sure my children can get some form of benefit. The argument was very strict, right? They said that the right ends in your kid because you only suffer the impact of inequality when you're alive. But the implication of that is that therefore I don't the state has the right to take away all the money when you're alive because that's where you start. That's where you know the impact of your horrible actions. But then when you're dead, then you should respect your right to do what you want the money. That makes no sense at all. We think that just because you're dead doesn't mean that you lose that ability. You know that like, when you're alive, you know that your children are cared for and don't be cared for. Finally, we argue very simply. What makes us human is knowing that our life is not constrained in just 60, 70 years to spend on this planet. And we spend and spend the time that we use on this planet for a greater purpose and for a greater future. And often for many people, that purpose is their children and their family. The sense of work, the sense of meaning in their life is constructed when they can pass something on to their children. And it is vital that these people get appreciate our economy, and that's why I'm very proud of the group because we think individuals matter. That there is value to them being able to leave and bequeath something behind to their children. That there is value in respecting their autonomy to decide what exactly happens to their wealth. I'll be talking about two things. 
justice and helping the needy in our communities. Let's talk about justice. Because if you were to listen to the substantive speeches, it was basically this. Lots of black people and lots of vulnerable people have been systematically disenfranchised by the oppressive metastructure and now is the time by which we need to reclaim our property from the rich people who ostensibly created this. The problem with this conception of justice is that it doesn't really meet out any justice at all. Because the people that it disproportionately affect are middle-income families who are not rich enough to engage lawyers, who are rich enough to pay tax funds, or informed enough to park their wealth elsewhere. What basically happens is that individuals who don't deserve their money to be stolen from them are effectively robbed blind. More importantly, the people who they are ostensibly trying to target, the rich, will be able to avoid the long hand of justice that they are, for, they are trying to advocate for on that side of the house. So if really your narrative is one of justice, we don't think justice is in any way achieved by you picking on the most vulnerable and the most defenseless in our society. The next he talked about was, but you inherited it. You didn't really deserve that at all. Now, we get that to some extent, and this is reasonable to allege, that you might have inherited some of that wealth, you may have accrued some kind of assistance in building that wealth up. But it is also true that the rest of it can be attributed to you as an individual and your efforts as well. They then consider that you benefited from that when you were alive. Now, let's think about that. You can see that we have an interest in our property when we're alive. Why does it magically disappear when you're dead? We don't think your death necessarily changes the ownership or the proprietary interest that you have in your property. And you can see that as long as it exists, you maintain control, then we allege that you maintain control throughout. Next, they said, the birth lottery is evil. Well, you're not doing anything about it because people are still disproportionately benefiting from it anyway. And the only way to go about it, the only true way, is to give, provide social opportunities for upward mobility for these individuals. And if that's true, your policy is not the only way to achieve that. Because as long as you can accrue enough of resources to benefit as many people as possible through several forms of taxes, we think that's sufficient in remedying the inequality. Next, helping the needy. We talked about two things. We said in my speech that this would inhibit job creation and that it would inhibit direct transfers of wealth that would immediately benefit people. They said, oh, but immediate consumption is good, right? You can spend on stuff. But then this is the point. You can spend on stuff. The economy may benefit, but you need the pool of resources meant to help individuals, which we think is the major source of assistance in these societies. They then said that the state can do better. We don't necessarily disagree with that, but what we argue is that individuals matter, autonomy matters. There's a reason why we don't rob people blind today, because we recognize there are certain rights and interests that need to be protected nevertheless. That we have to balance the most re reasonable approach towards that world to try and benefit society in the best way possible. Ladies and gentlemen, in my last year of the pandemic debate speech, it's been a fun four years. Thank you one and all for the lovely experiences. <laughs> And on my own terms, and with much pride, this motion must fall. because this is for their family's welfare. They claim that primarily it is because this is targeting middle-class families. But if you look at it, if this is really for welfare and if this is for middle-class families, it's going to be equal on both sides because the state can equally provide that for these people. 
If they want to save up for trust funds, they can provide good public schools in replacement. If they want to save up for medical insurance because they're afraid that their children are going to get sick, we can provide free healthcare systems and free social services under our model. If they want to provide security because they have bodyguards under their model, we can lessen crime rates under our side because the money that they are using on their own families is now redistributed to everyone else so that the state can make sure that that privilege is not just to a specific family but for everyone else. So if this debate was about the middle class and about the poor, it's for everyone and that is equal under both models. What they didn't de defend though is what if the impact that the individual wants to dictate towards their family is beyond welfare. It is for the advantages that from the very beginning Jesus laid out to you as the problem. The problem is NUS argued to you in a very characterization based manner in this debate. They only wanted to target the middle class. But they never provided us the exact same credence of engagement that we gave them. That if this debate was about the middle class, we have these. But if this debate was about the super rich, what are you doing about them, right? The second problem is this. The fact that you have inheritance tax under your model concedes that those over-rich individuals are problematic as well. But did they ever define how effective an unquantified inheritance tax under their model will be? No. The second reason why they will lose is because they are, have a very heavily inconsistent policy with the values that they presuppose in this debate. They distrust the state to distribute wealth, right? But did they ever defend why the rich are going to be more trustworthy than the state? Even chiefs found them very problematic under their model when these people start lobbying towards the state. So what more if they can just directly withhold on to that, you know, to that wealth and directly for the kind of amount of wealth? But more importantly, they distrust the state, but towards Imran's speech, it's the same state that apparently will impose all of those taxes that he now wants to levy on them. Higher inheritance taxes, income taxes, whatever types of taxes that he wants or is expecting to be levied on these individuals. If you distrust them so much, and if you think that they're not responsible, why are also who you going to be relying on them under your model, right? That just simply does not make sense. But here's the most important reason why they're going to lose. Because in the end, you have to realize that Xiao's speech was particularly offensive. Inheritance, in this new idea, is not what makes us human. In fact, because if that's the standard that we use as an indicator of human dignity or the identity marker of individuals, then those people who do not have inheritance to pass on to their children by their standards are not human and do not deserve human dignity, right? That means that human dignity under their model is spent on money or is spent on wealth. We find this offensive because we, in the end, we do acknowledge that all human beings are born equal. The only thing that we're trying to do on the affirmative side is to make sure that we live that way too. Thank you.